Good evening and welcome to the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. My name is Kat Gareshka and I am delighted to welcome you to our special opening night event. A little over one year ago, Real Abilities Boston became one of the first film festivals in the world to go virtual because of this pandemic. And a year later, here we are, um, all so much more versed in everything and anything virtual. And here at Real Abilities, we're making sure to take every advantage of this virtual format by broadening accessibility, offering captions, audio description, cards, ASL interpretation where possible, and by coming straight to your living room or wherever it is in your home that you feel comfortable these days. On opening night last year, I offered some words on isolation, um, but frankly, what isolation means and how it affects us as individuals and as professionals has come under more scrutiny than we had ever imagined it could. What we meant when referring to isolation 14 months ago has gone through a long process of redefinition and reevaluation. And so have many things really, including the notion of home, of place, and of what matters most to each of us. So while much remains to be done to end the pandemic and to end the still persisting underrepresentation of disabilities on screen, there are reasons to celebrate today. Disabilities are more and more visible in film and television and more and more quality content is produced by and about people with different disabilities and those representing a range of neurodiversity. And here we are on this 10th anniversary to bring you some of the best and newest narrative and documentary films from across the globe, which raise awareness and celebrate stories from within the disability community. And we're also here to create a space where disabled people are seen as opposed to just looked at. And with this, allow me to introduce the executive director of Boston Jewish Film, Susan Adler, to offer her opening remarks. Thank you, Kat. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 10th annual Real Abilities Boston Film Festival. Boston Jewish Film is so proud to reach this 10th anniversary milestone. Over these past 10 years, the festival has grown and we've been able to expand with our virtual festival to offer our real abilities worldwide. Together, we've shared so many stories, films, and events that have moved us and increased our awareness about inclusion and appreciation of the lives and artistic expressions of people with disabilities. Real Abilities Boston could not have reached this special anniversary without the very generous and unwavering support of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Sharon Shapiro has been a true champion of Real Abilities Boston from the very start. We also recognize the generous and sustaining support of the JE and ZB Butler Foundation, the NLM Family Foundation, the Rita J and Stanley H. Kaplan Family Foundation, the Mass Cultural Council and the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project. We deeply appreciate our many film sponsors and community partners for their financial and promotional support. Everyone at Boston Jewish Film is part of a very dedicated team and we are fortunate to have the insightful guidance and leadership of the Boston Jewish Film Board of Directors and the Real Abilities Boston Advisory Board. We present Real Abilities Boston for you, our audience, and we are so grateful for the enthusiasm and support you provide for this festival year after year. I hope you enjoy all of the films and programs at Real Abilities Boston now through May 13th. And now let me turn it back over to Kat Koreski to continue our opening night program. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, now, Without further ado, let me welcome our guests tonight. And let me start with Judy Bolton Fassman, who is the arts and culture writer for Jewish Boston, where she covers books, films, and events that capture the current zeitgeist. This week, make sure to check out Judy's reviews of films in our Real Abilities program. 
Judy's essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, Boston Globe, The Forward, Tablet Magazine, Kanishanti, and numerous other literary magazines. And in September, Mandel Villar Press will publish her book, Asylum, A Memoir of Family Secrets. And I personally cannot wait to read it. Go to judyboltonfassman.com to keep track of Judy's work. Judy, thank you so much for being here. And now I'd like you to introduce our main act, Riva Lehrer. Thank you so much, Katka. That was really lovely. Um, and it, I have the distinct honor and pleasure this evening to introduce our special guest tonight, Riva Lehrer. I first encountered Riva through her stunning award-winning memoir, Golem Girl and then interviewed her for Jewish Boston. Although she came to my attention initially as a critically acclaimed writer, Riva is a master artist whose portraits of disability, some of which we'll be viewing tonight, are deeply affecting. We'll delve into her process during our conversation, but for a moment, I want to just take, take the moment to point out that Riva's art and prose are really revelatory. As Riva writes in Golem Girl, the heart of disability is imagination. She lives that every day. So please join me in welcoming artist, writer, and activist, Riva Lehrer. Hi, everyone. Hi, Boston. I miss you. It's been a <laughs> while. I thought you loved me. Um, someday I'll come back to you. Uh, I get yelled at a lot for not doing this. So I'm doing this. Here's the book. There we go. Yeah. I have done. I've done my due diligence. Ah, what a coincidence. You also have a copy. Um, <clears throat> I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, representation of disability means everything to me. And festivals like this, I think they're some of the most effective ways that we have of changing the discourse. So Riva, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a pretty basic question, but I think it's a question that's sort of on everyone's mind. Um, well, before I do that, I forgot. I need to congratulate you. You just found out today that you won, let me get it right, the Society of Midland Authors Award for Biography and Memoir. Congratulations. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. It's fantastic. Very sweet of you. So, um, now I'm going to ask you about the image of the golem versus Frankenstein. You called your book Golem Girl, and I have sort of have a two-parter here. It feels like you're calling your book out as a Jewish book, and you actually think you wrote a Jewish book. Last time I looked, I, <laughs> unless someone took out all the Yiddish when I wasn't looking, <laughs> um, except you made me laugh a minute ago because you give me the image of the golem and Frankenstein in a mano a mano, creature o creature o smackdown. And okay, here's my friend the golem. This is uh, a reproduction of the 1916, I think, um, silent film Der Goylem uh, from Yiddish theater, mm -hmm. a version of the of the play from Yiddish theater. Um, the so when you say verses, do you just want me to explain what the golem means in this particular book or to differentiate between the two? Well, I, I think a little bit of both, perhaps just a quick differentiation. And then why did you call your book Golem Girl? I mean, that's a very deliberate choice of word. Um, well, <clears throat> uh, there's a... A belief that Mary uh, Wollstone Craft Shelley um, knew of uh, the story of the golem when she was writing Frankenstein. It was not an obscure tale. It's been around since the um, 17th century uh, and actually before that. Um, <clears throat> this is usually morning voice. It's decided to be evening voice instead. Luckily, I have hot beverage. Um, the original golem is actually from Genesis. Adam is called um, uh, a shapeless mass, uh, a golem or a goylem, which is the literal meaning as just a, a sort of a lumpen creature. Um, and 
all the way through history, there are these stories of, um, of humanoids built by, you know, living people and then uh, magically animated through mystical means, whether that's something divine or mechanical or secret knowledge, it's secret knowledge of some kind. <clears throat> and all of these uh, creatures are always built to serve the purposes of their masters. And they're allowed to exist as long as they serve those purposes. And once they stop doing so, they're almost always destroyed. And in the story of the golem, once the golem, which I'm going to assume most of us out there know the story, mm -hmm. um, once the golem starts, stops, uh, or rather once the golem has protected the Jews of Prague, um, and then at the same time become enormously large and unwieldy. Um, he transitions from being a threat, or I'm sorry, a savior to the community to a threat to the community. And the rabbi destroys him. And in Frankenstein, the creature is built um, for the glory of, the, of science and mainly the scientist, for the scientist's ego. And because it's not controllable, because it's ugly, because the Victor Frankenstein can't show him off and, and make him um, uh, do his tricks for the audience. Um, Dr. Frankenstein tries to destroy him and it does not go well. Um, in many cases, uh, these stories are actually at base about the failure of a parent to love, that a parent creates a child, and this is the primary connection at first to disability, is that the parent creates a monstrous child and cannot accept the child for what it is, either runs away or tries to destroy the child. And this is where the tragedies begin to ensue. In my case, that is not what happened. My mother, right from the beginning, more than accepted me. She fought for me like crazy. However, the same was not true of my society. Um, it's not that they tried to destroy me, it's that they tried to, as with almost all disabled people um, at the time that I was a child in particular, they just tried to keep us hidden in institutions, out of, out of sight, in people, in their parents' back bedroom. We didn't have any purpose at all for our world. And so I was thinking about purpose, that the golem, like I said, is built for a purpose, um, but it's not his or her own purpose ever. The monsters are never built for their own purposes. So I was thinking about disabled people at the time that I was born, there was this whole wave of medical breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And so children are being saved because their parents insisted that they be saved and because science wanted to see what was possible, but none of that was for the child's own purpose. There was, no, there was nothing we could be in our world. So I think of my version of Golem Girl um, as being the, the effort of a monstrous child to find out if it can have a purpose of its own. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So I thought what we do now is, if if you if you may, um, can you please read a bit from your wonderful book so we can hear? Sure, I'm going to now switch screens, and let me set this up just a tiny bit. Okay. Um, this is uh, the year is 1970. I am 12 years old. Um, we have just uh, moved house. My mother had, uh, starting when I was a small child, my mother had begun to become disabled for entirely different reasons. So you'll see a re hear a reference to her having surgeons as well. Um, but when the scene starts, I'm in a great mood. I've had a, a wonderful day at school. Um, the school is a huge part of the book, by the way. I went to a special school um, of which there is much to say but that is not what this is about. But I did choose this because uh, it is about the other aspect of being a golem. 
which is that I am built. I am a construction. I've had several dozen surgeries. My book is not a medical travelogue. It's not about that. But it is about the sense of being a construction um, and having a body that you do not entirely uh, possess, that it's in part a possession of others. Okay. All right, so like I said, I've just come off the, the school bus and I'm in a great mood. Mom was sitting at the dining room table, pasting green stamps into one of our bazillion coupon books. Those of you around my age, you'll know what I'm talking about. The rest of you, just stay with it. Our toaster, blender, and electric knife were all converted from green stamps. That tells you something about our grocery bills. She looked happy too. Hey, great news. I just got off the phone. We have an appointment with a, that new orthopedic surgeon. Well, that drained the helium right out of my high. I dropped into a chair and started pasting stamps too. Gra Glad for the soothing repetition of filling page after page. Mom, you mean a surgeon for you? Do I get to go to one of your appointments? This was a first. The thought was both scary and like an important rite of passage. But I don't remember anything about this. No, no, he's a pediatric specialist. I must have told you. Dr. Street? Still no? Well, You'll meet him next Wednesday. I hear great things about his ability to help children who limp as badly as you do. This was nuts. It had barely been a year since they yanked out my gallbladder and here she was lining me, lining up another trip to the OR. I argued, but really, I don't mind my limp. Everybody else makes it such a big deal. I often forgot I limped until I saw my shadow bouncing on the sidewalk or until some ever helpful passerby pointed out that there was something wrong with me. You might not mind your limp, but it's not good for your back and you complain more than you think. The next Wednesday, grandma and mom picked me up after school. I stared out the window and practiced my nose in my head. No, 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 no. Sorry, my window is open and Chicago is outside. What can one do? Uh, sorry, I assume you could hear the traffic. Grandma said to call the drugstore when we were done. In the exam room, I shed my school clothes. Sorry, I'm getting strange messages. In the exam room, I shed my school clothes for the usual overwashed tie back gown, even though meeting a doctor without my clothes on made me feel defenseless as a, as a boiled egg. Mom always said, get over it. Doctors are too busy to wait. The door opened. Riva, Mrs. Lair, it's a pleasure to meet you both. Dr. Street shook our hands. He had passionate eyebrows, sharply cut hair, and the coiled posture of a distance runner. He said, your mother says you don't like wearing those heavy shoes. Miss Riva, I don't blame you. A pretty girl like you should have pretty shoes. I could help you have any shoes you want. High heels, flip-flops, tennis shoes. Despite myself, I felt a flutter of excitement. Ever since I was little, I'd gotten my orthopedic shoes at Ludwig's Shoe Shop, where they put a thick prescription lift on the left sole. Only certain shoes were brawny enough to take the weight. So year after year, I got identical black and white saddle shoes. I'd moon over the patent leather Mary Janes, the red ball jets, the sandals with those teensy little straps, even as mom marched me straight to the clod hoppers at the rear of the store. I narrowed my eyes and said, go, go boots, all innocent, knowing it, this was a ridiculous test. Dr. Street laughed with delight. Go, go boots, he roared. He said, that young bones could be pruned and shaped like bonsai trees, but that they fused into permanent shapes as soon as you stopped growing. Then he, he frowned. I only had a few months left before I'd be twisted for life, left hip too high, right leg too long. But if you have this surgery, you'll grow up straighter and taller. All we have to do is cut a little piece of bone out of your right knee. And here came the diagrams, cripes. 
His reflex hammer drew an arc above my patella. My skin goose, goose bumped under the cotton exam gown. The epiphyseal, say that 10 times fast. The epiphyseal plate is like a clock. It tells your leg when to stop growing. We'll tell it to stop growing now. And your left leg will catch up and hey presto, no more terrible shoes. Not only that, your spine won't curve anymore. You'll look just like other girls. I saw myself running down the hill behind our house, wearing high top sneakers and jeans just like Doug's. Only my jeans would have fringe and, and rhinestone studs and really big bells. And what about those silver shoes at Ludwig's with the perforated toes? How cool would they look with my spark sparkly pink dress? I blinked. Mom was glowing like a convert to a new religion. On the way home, Grandma and Mom talked plans. I was heading for another summer in the hospital. I hardly listened. By eighth grade, I'd be so normal, I wouldn't need Condon school. A thought that brought every possible emotion in its wake. That night, I lay down and wiggled my hips till my legs were the same length. I gazed at them kindly, my new, old, new appendages. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Reva. Um, I want to pick up a little bit um, on the Condon School. It plays a very big role in the book, and it played a very big role in your life, and it also led you into art. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, um, your journey there your, and your experiences. Uh, talk a little bit. Um, <laughs> talk a lot. <laughs> it was hard not to write the entire book about Condon. Mm. Um, well, uh, as the movie, the specials say, say, how do you know you're special? You go to a special school. Um, when I was growing up, you weren't supposed to tell anyone that that's where you went. It was known as, and forgive me, I apologize ahead of time, but what it was called was the retard school. So if you told anyone you went there, that's what they called you. So we were all very secretive, although they would scream that at our school bus every time we came and went from school. The school was originally built in 1919. Um, at the time, it was state of the art accessibility. Uh, now we would laugh, um, but back then, this was like spaceship crip. Um, it was kindergarten through eighth grade, mm -hmm. and it was. Um, elevators and restrooms in every room and uh, teachers who were trained up to a point uh, insofar as it existed in, in um, disability education. But um, it was also, it was complicated. Um, it was where I learned about disability community because when I walked into the school, I was safe. I was just a kid. When I walked out of the school, I was the weirdo the one who was different. And it was that was true for almost everyone who went there. So some of us just passionately bonded together and were afraid of being in the world. Um, the biggest problem with the school, and there were a number, was that, as I said at the time, there was no place for kids like me in the world. So even though, so the, the remarkable thing actually about Condon was not the accessibility of the building. It was the fact that almost all schools for disabled kids at the time um, were institutional, uh, they were residential, and they were vocational at best. They would train you to work in something like a sheltered workshop, and that was it. Condon was considered a breakthrough because it was built around um, standard elementary school pedagogy, um, somewhat adapted for, for the for us, but more or less standard in terms of, you know, a regular elementary school in Cincinnati. But unlike all of those other schools, we were never asked what we were going to be. We were never given any career guidance. We weren't, we weren't encouraged to dream um, because just for instance, back when I uh, graduated, and by the way, 
you'll see in the book, anyone who reads it, there's a part about asking for a pendant, um, sort of a uh, safety charm. When I left Condon in eighth grade that says Condon School 1963 to 1972, I'm still wearing it most of my life later. And the reason I had it was that um, we we're stepping into the total unknown. There were no rules about any of us being let into high school. Well, I'm not saying it right. High schools were under no obligation to take us. Forget college. High schools were not under any obligation. So for a lot of us, eighth grade was as far as we were going to go. But then you went on to a um, to a, 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 a an all girls private high school. And, and I you did talk a little bit about that. And I and I I, I want to get in also where you where you discovered art. <clears throat> Well, I mean, my mom was an artist. My mom's side of the family had, a, had and has a lot of visual talent. Um, I inherited that from mom. Mm -hmm. um, if you're an art kid, you know what I mean when I say that the art room is your safety, your safe place. And you find that out really young. So if you're lucky, you have talent that can keep you in the art room, but um, the, feeling of it being your place just kind of mysteriously shows up. So I think right from kindergarten, I figured that out. Um, but that is a, being good at art in elementary school and high school is a different thing than becoming an, an artist, going to art school and mm -hmm. finding out if you, if you're anything more than a mildly talented kid who likes to draw. Right, right. So we're talking about art and we're, we're about to view your incredible portraits. And um, you and I had a wonderful conversation when I talked to you for Jewish Boston about your process and what happens in the studio between you and your subjects. I mean, you're doing <clears throat> incredibly intimate work and your subjects for the most part um, are vulnerable and you have some very, uh, strict guidelines that you follow um, with your subjects that, and, and one of them is that you always face each other. Um, more, yeah, more or less true. Um, the way that I work, so there's, there's a lot of long story behind all of this, but uh, I ran away from being disabled for most of my life until I was in my mid, late thirties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was a tragedy and I tried to deny it as much as I could. And then I met this group of people um, who are some of the most well-known founders of disability culture in our country who happened to live in Chicago. And they, <laughs> they informed me that there was politics <laughs> and that there was theory and that there was humor and all these things that I had been completely ignorant of all those years. And so um, for a lot of reasons, I decided to try and do their portraits. But I knew right away that um, being looked at has always been hard for me. Um, it's hard for a lot of disabled people. We're targeted, we're insulted, we're abused, we're mocked, we're made fun. I mean, you name it. I'm sure so many people out there in the audience know what I'm talking about, where you're just going down the street and here come the insults and here come the rude questions and here come the well-meaning comments and here's the, the, the offer to pray over you until Jesus heals your affliction. And I mean, it's just, it's a daily occurrence. And the problem with portraiture is that portraiture is being looked at. So I had to figure out how to ask people if I could look at them. Mm -hmm. um, so that led me to ethics and the ethics of shared control. And so um, there are various different structures through which I do this, but the main thing is that in each project, there's been a way of me ceding control partly or wholly to my uh, portrait collaborator. And so um, the center of that is, uh, is conversation where I'm interviewing the person um, about their life and then taking 
those conversations and starting to build images with a lot of back and forth, a lot of checking in about um, whether they're true for, for the person I'm working with. So um, shall I pull up some images? That would be great. And um, while you do that, I want to ask you um, the flip side of that question is what's it like to do your own self-portrait of which you've done quite a few? Uh, well, let's, 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 let's do it. Let's do see one thing at a time. It's a lot of big questions. Um, hang on, where's my PowerPoint? Here it is. OK. Uh, and I think I'll ask you, Judy, if there are particular images that you would like to um, start with. I thought it would be really interesting to talk about the cover, to, to begin with the cover. Okay, um, here we go with uh, screen share. Hang on a second. Bear with me, patient audience. Um, where is screen share? Here we are. Okay, so, uh, sorry, oh, come now. All right, um, so that uh, is the cover, um, partly cut off here for some reason. Hang on a second, sorry. You know, PowerPoint is just not made for these things. Um, so that's the cover. But this is the image that it's drawn from. Right. Um, so the cover is a detail of this piece, which is a self-portrait um, called Blue Veronica. Um, it's uh, a Veronica is um, taken from Christian iconography. And it's uh, a form of miraculous portrait. Um, has to do with the story of St. Veronica. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about the Christian tradition of miraculous portraiture, including things like the Shroud of Turin, um, you know, various visions of Mary, seeing Jesus in a slice of toast, all of these things, and how they have this in common with medical images, which is that they're mysterious to the everyday viewer. They have to be interpreted. They arise out of extreme experience for the most part. And um, there's usually uh, an intercessor who has to translate um, the image for, for, the, uh, for the believer. Um, there are also things about diagnoses that I won't go into, but, uh, but so I was thinking about my own spinal x-ray as a form of a, a Veronica. Um, what would you like to, to look at next? I'd love to see the next self-portrait of you. Uh, I think next in, next in the queue. Um, it's the previous one. Uh, yeah, do you, do you mind, since we don't have that much time, I'd, I'd really like to show things I've done to other, other people. That would be fantastic. <laughs> kind of more important. Um, uh, it, of the other people, is there one that you're particularly fond of that you'd like to? Uh, Alice Wong. Okay, that is um, not here. That is not here. Alice isn't there? No, she is not. Um, so here, well, let's talk about other things. Okay. Um, I will be in charge. Uh, That's it. Okay, so here is, yes, this is mysterious. There are a lot that are not here. Um, uh, here is a, a drawing. Yeah. Of, uh, the performer Nomi Lamb, who now lives in uh, San Francisco. Um, Nomi is a singer, performance artist, um, fat activist, and uh, now the artistic director of uh, Sins Invalid um, Performance Theater uh, based in Oakland, which, my God, I highly, highly recommend that people look up um, videos of Sins Invalid. They do some of the most radical work anywhere. They've been taking on issues of sex and race and class from day one. Mm -hmm. And um, so Nomi sat for me back in 2007. And um, I work in series. So each project has a set of questions that I ask all of the participants 
and um, uh, and then sort of just let the viewer see how each person's life answers that question. So in this case, this had to do with a series where I was asking people about the um, objects, the, the metaphors, objects and metaphors that got them through uh, periods of trauma. Mm -hmm. So um, Nomi chose a seal. And so, and no, we unfortunately, oof, I wasn't able to actually draw her underwater, which would have been so cool, but it's bad for the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a large charcoal. Um, this is somebody you guys might know, um, uh, Liz Carr the British actress, um, actor rather, sorry, and comedian and activist. Um, Liz has been a star for a while of, um, uh, it's like every, I hope you guys can't hear these noises. I feel like I'm in Grand Central. Um, uh, Liz is a star of a long running um, British crime show called Silent Witness. She's also been on the OA and several other things of late here in the States. Um, when people come through Chicago, I pretty much just throw a net over them, drag them in my studio and make them sit for me. So Liz was coming through on a, a, on a performance tour and spent part of a week in my studio letting me paint her. So this is a painting. And then this is... Riva, I was wondering if you would talk about your the, your portrait of Alison Bechdel since people know her work and know her for Fun Home. And um, well, her brand new book is out too this week. Yes, yes. Um, so I don't just work with people with disabilities. I work with people in the LGBTQ community. Um, I work with basically I'm interested in people who deal with stigma um, yeah. for whatever reason, and that can be very hard to define stigma as well. Just people who, who've always felt very much like an outsider. In Allison's case, uh, you know, being, being queer um, is uh, obviously part of her story. So um, she was writing, she had done Fun Home and she was working on Are You My Mother, which was the follow-up memoir about her mother. And I was, uh, I, I hadn't even started the book yet, but I was thinking about, um, I think I'd written an essay about my mom back then for something. And uh, I won't say what it is because I don't want to spoil a part of the narrative, but um, there are parts of Allison's story of her life with her parents that overlaps with mine or is echoed by mine. And so we were talking about um, childhood and trauma and looking back. And so um, I originally was gonna draw her, if you, I don't know if you can see, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. So if you look here, my original intention was to draw her as Mo, um, the character in Dykes to Watch Out For, which is what she became famous for, um, which is her sort of doppelganger. And she had just stopped doing uh, dykes and was uh, had moved to the memoir work. And she was getting shit from people um, for having done that. They, the lesbian community felt, some of them felt sort of betrayal and it was hard for Allison. And I was also moving away from just working with people with disabilities and was working in other um, with other kinds of stigma and there were people who weren't happy with me about that. So we were talking about looking back and, but our conversations kept going on to our mother. So I asked her um, if she would uh, do a drawing of her mother. Um, so what, this is a big drawing. So what I did was I put a big sheet of tracing paper over the whole thing. I did a really precise tracing of just the background and Allison and nothing else mm -hmm. and send it to her in Vermont where she lives and um, waited and said, just draw your mother in here somewhere and I'll transfer it to your portrait. And what happened was, well, it took weeks. <laughs> I was starting to freak out because I was under show deadline. Um, so the, the wages of collaboration uh, 
So I get back this drawing and it absolutely just blew me sideways because, um, and Allison says she wasn't thinking about this, but so in the drawing, this is uh, Helen Bechdel and she's reading the book that Alice, Allison is writing about her and she's ignoring her daughter, um, which is what the book is about, is about the, the chill in that, the complicated chill in that relationship. But the thing that just absolutely knocked me out is if you look here, in the reflection in the mirror is the only place where Allison and her mother are together. Mm -hmm. Allison is facing away, her mother is looking down. So they would be united in the reflection, except that Helen's smoke, the, the line of Helen's smoke crosses out the shadow of the mirror. And a lot of the book is based on psychoanalytic theory, or you're my mother and uses uh, Winnicott's theory quite a bit about parenting. And so this is what's called a narcissistic wound, a primary narcissistic wound where the parent rejects the child. So here we have an actual enactment of the rejection of the child. And when I talked to Allison later and just started saying I'd been in tears when I unrolled the drawing, she just kind of, there was a long silence. She said, huh, I didn't really think about that. <laughs> That's why she got the MacArthur grant, you know, the rest of us are just kind of trying to make a living. Um, but I, in all seriousness, I think the point I want to make about my work, and I'm just going to click through some images. I'm not going to tell the stories. I'm just going to click through a few of these. Um, yeah. Is that uh, each collaboration for me is life changing. And I know people say that a lot. Huh, there's a lot of missing images. Sorry, people. Um, not sure what happened here. Um, this is part of a much larger drawing. Uh, so another self-portrait. Um, so you gotta stop screen share. Um, when you think about the fact that when I was in my late 30s, before I met the people that I met in the, the Chicago Disability Artist Collective, before I started doing this portrait work, um, I could not stand who I was. Um, this is not an overcoming story. There are plenty of days where I still can't really stand who I am. But understanding how other people live in their bodies uh, is the only reason I'm still here. Each time I meet somebody and they tell me about the relationship between their bodies and their work, their bodies and their biography, my understanding of embodiment gets larger. And for that reason, it's hard for me to think of these pieces as separate things. They feel to me like a travelogue mm -hmm. of um, transformation for me. And, and I've heard from my subjects that, that it's their profound experiences for them as well. I can imagine. Um, you know, in, in my introduction, I talked about you being a writer and an artist and an activist, but another important part of your life is you're a teacher. And I was wondering if you could talk about particularly your teaching to medical school students. <clears throat> um, I have taught at the School of the Art Institute for something like 18 years now. Um, but I started teaching pretty much back in when I was in high school. So I've been teaching most of my life. Uh, and back in 2006, I think, I got invited to be part of the medical humanities program at uh, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. And I started to develop a pedagogy around medical humanities, which has changed over the years. Um, and for uh, my department at UIC shut down and became bioethics and we all lost our jobs. And a bunch of us ended up over at um, Northwestern instead. Right. And so uh, at Northwestern, I, I was there for a few years and then I ended up developing this course called Drawing in a Jar. And it's based on my experience of um, visiting the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. And I'm guessing a lot of people out there because you're on the East Coast, 
I imagine there's some people out there who've been to the Mutter, which is a museum of um, uh, medical specimens, um, human remains. And one of the things that happened at the Mutter is that I happened on a case that was entirely filled with fetuses with um, uh, uh, developmental variations. And I write about it in the book. I, I don't want to go into that story here. But it led me through a lot of deep thinking about how I felt about the display of remains. And you may be um, surprised to know that I'm not against it. In fact, I'm very much for it. But I'm for it with extremely careful uh, investment and context. Um, and so because of my time at the Mutter Museum, um, well, well, I was teaching at Northwestern. I was teaching in one of the separate buildings, but um, at UIC, I had been teaching in the cadaver lab. And so at Northwestern one day I said, oh, you know, could I see the cadaver lab here? I miss being, I miss my rotations there. I really love cadaver lab. I'm actually writing about it again right now. Uh, and so I walk into the cadaver lab and what is there but an entire wall of cases with vitrines exactly like those at the Mutter Museum with fetuses with a whole range of morphological variations by which I mean co-joined twins, uh, hydrocephalus, spina bifida, which is mine, um, gastroschisis, which is where the organs are extruded, and encephaly where the brain doesn't develop, a whole lot of different things. Some things are survivable and some things are not. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, these, these med students are in here every day seeing this. And I asked the director, are they teaching from these anymore? And I said, no, they're just kind of here. We don't really know what to do with them. So I developed a course where my students come in uh, during the winter short semester. And um, I teach them uh, how to draw through drawing one of the fetuses. So student comes in, they choose one of the vitrines, we position it for the rest of the semester, no one's allowed to touch it. Um, they're very heavy and they're very fragile, these things. And so bit by bit, I teach my student how to draw and most of these are not kids with um, any kind of drawing background. But at the same time, I'm talking about how beautiful these, um, uh, I call them entities in class. Mm -hmm. um, I try not to use specimen. I often don't use fetus. I try and just use entity. Um, and about the fact that I know people who have these same variations. I talk about the Mutter Museum. I talk about the fact that in medical museums, specimens are there either to tell you that it's a condition that is supposed to be cured out of existence or one that will be cured out of existence because of the power of medicine. And so they're never supposed to be present bodies. They're always supposed to be bodies that we reject either immediately or potentially. And so as we're going across the semester, I'm having them then find someone who's lived within the last 25 years, who's had either the same uh, impairment or, or a similar one. So for instance, with anencephaly where there's um, very little or no brain development, the person would find someone with microcephaly who's mm -hmm. had a public life in some way. So whether someone's written about them, done a film about them, or whether they've presented themselves ideally in the world, mm -hmm. or whether they've had a career that's been um, public. We end the semester by my students uh, doing a presentation about a living person so that they think about these as not as historical bodies, but as living ones. That's, um, that's, very, that's incredible. And I wanna ask, <clears throat> do we have time for one more question or two questions? Um, I want, or do we want to take questions from, from the there audience. Are, there are a couple of, here I am. There are a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one of them is a question that I also wanted to ask. It's about Bill Shannon, who, who you portrayed. But I, I want to preface this question uh, on my end by 
reminding our audience, if, if Riva looks familiar to you, it's because she was featured in Code of the Freaks, which is a film that we showed last year at the festival. Um, so I also want to ask you what it was like to collaborate with <laughs> Salome Chasnov and Susan Nussbaum. And Susan, I know you've, you've portrayed. And um, so what was that like for you? And then Bill Shannon is slightly from a different world, but, but not 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 so much and also this year we are featuring crutch the the you know the major documentary about bill shannon that just came out um and it's a very interesting part in the book where you where you actually where where we see the portrait of, of bill shannon where you write about how making a portrait is always a little bit falling in love even if for a moment can you talk about that a little bit uh um, so Code of the Freaks, um, I ended up talking about Frankenstein, unsurprisingly, um, in the film. Um, I was flattered that they asked me because I'm certainly no film expert, but <clears throat> Carrie Sandal, Salome Chasnoff, Susan Nussbaum, um, I remember, I think Techie, Techie's in it, but I don't think she was one of the, or Lori Little, I think is the other person who was on the film. Um, I mean, they've spent years and years and years working on a disability representation. Um, Susan is an actor and a playwright um, and knows all this from every possible side. I learned a lot from um, watching the film I mean, it was great being part of it, but I, I mainly feel like it's really um, uh, <laughs> not something that has existed up till now and really helps give sort of a, a thread linking um, the past with, with the efforts of the present to not run away from the past, but to recontextualize how our images have been used. Um, in terms of Bill, um, I mean, I can show the image. Uh, Please, yeah, we can see. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice. Click to add, to no, I don't know why it's doing this. Don't do that. We, we see it, it's there. <sighs> it's one of these days. Um, so, uh, Bill, um, hang on. No. Okay. Sorry. Uh, go back. Just trying to get some kind of decent view of this. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I tell this story in the book. The main thing I guess I can say is that I mentioned meeting people who are the um, founding members of some of the founding members of disability culture in America. And Bill was one of those people. We were both students at the School of the Art Institute at the time. And one of the things I mentioned in the book, which I'll never forget, is that um, you, know, you guys will know that Bill is, among other things, a stunt skateboarder and a uh, serious skateboard artist is, more, more to the point. And he used to skate around downtown Chicago using his crutches as, you know, sort of the way you would pull a raft. And um, he was so gorgeous at it, so skilled and impressive that people thought that the crutches were like some kind of punk affectation, that nobody believed that he was actually disabled, which used to just completely double me over in laughter. Um, but I mean, he's, he's gone on since then to just do such spectacular things. We have um, another question from the audience that's in the chat that I will read to you, Riva. Um, you mentioned in your reading getting saddle shoes for the first time. I'm curious as to if you actually wore them and how that felt for you. No, I said that I always had saddle shoes. Every single year, I had the same pair of saddle shoes. Um, I don't remember the first time I was probably four. 
uh, I hated them with a passion. I absolutely hated them. Um, yeah, I mean, the surgery that I mentioned, um, again, it's, it's hard to, I'm really reluctant to let you know where stories go in the book. Um, but the story does not end up with me not having to wear saddle shoes anymore. I'll just say that. So for the most part, for my whole life, I have had shoes that I would have preferred to be other than what I had. Can you revamp, because we are gonna have to wrap up, but I, I'd like you to mention again, the award that you won literally hours ago. I mean, we saw your, you, you messaging us about it. It's uh, um, and what is it again? Uh, well, I mean, the book is, has won a few things. Um, it won the Barbellion Prize, which is a brand new prize uh, based in London um, for literature. <clears throat> it deals with, um, with disability and, and illness. So this is the first year for that. It got shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and that was a very big deal. Um, I didn't win, but being shortlisted is is a it's a big deal. Um, I have been told. Um, it was shortlisted for a few other things, and then today it won the Mid Midlands, the Society of Midlands Authors Award, which I believe is a guild for authors in the, um, you know, in the central Midwest. And so the book was up against another short list of, I guess a long list and then a short list of, of uh, memoirs. And this morning I found out that the book won. So that is a very nice thing. And thank you. Thank you, Midlanders. Respect. And congratulations to you, Riva. Thank you. Um, I, if you will let me, Riva, I want to read literally two lines from your book that really struck me and they, they sound a bit ominous. They, they're in, I think, I believe it's part of the epilogue, uh, but I found them very um, optimistic actually and very uplifting. So I, I, I just wanna offer that and wrap up um, for tonight. Um, and I quote, in the coming decades, humanity must reimagine how to do every damn thing in the world. Disabled people are experts in finding new ways to do things when the old ways don't work. We are a vast think tank right in plain sight, a bottomless well of ingenuity and creativity. End quote. And let me just add that it's my hope that we have somewhat at least succeeded in bringing you some of this ingenuity and creativity in this year's festival lineup. Join us through May 13th for a diverse international program of films and live conversations. And you can do this with us online um, and share the experience with anyone across the US as we are streaming nationwide this year. Watch films, join the live programs, please support us by donating and I want to offer special thanks tonight to the City of Cambridge Commission for Persons with Disabilities and Department of Human Service Programs for their eighth year of partnership with Real Abilities Boston. Kate Thurman, Rachel Tannenhaus, we can't wait to hold an actual in-person screening at the Cambridge Public Library again soon. Uh, we also owe special thanks to Women and Children First Bookstore, where you can purchase Riva's book with a special Real Abilities discount and get your copy now. I've read the book and I highly recommend it. Thank you. Um, and once again, many thanks to our guests tonight, Riva, Judy, thank you so much. We hope to see you all this coming Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern for a special live Mother's Day event featuring a conversation with the makers of Wildflower. Thank you all so much again. Thank you. Thank you, you everybody. Thank you Pleasure. for having me. Pleasure. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you. I saw how hard you worked. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kaka. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.